Welcome to the Maranatha Bible Class with Bible teacher Bob Suriano. Laodicea, a short history on this particular city. It was originally destroyed in A.D. 60, and according to the Roman writer Titicus, uh, Rome had offered to pay and rebuild the city because it would have, had great in, importance to uh, ancient Rome. But the people there declined uh, they said that they were wealthy enough that they could rebuild the city themselves, so they didn't want Rome's help. This this particular city was renowned for three major industries at the time. Number one was banking. It was a major banking center for the providence of Asia Minor. Uh, it also included having a gold exchange. Uh, number two, it was known for its textile industry and in particular where they made a black wool that was uh, well sought after, highly paid for, especially in the Roman world. And number three, they were known for having a major medical school uh, in the city of Laodicea. And they were able to find some kind of a local stone that they would grind to powder and they would make an eye salve to help people that were having difficulty with cataracts, it was believed to help them see better. Uh, So these were the three main things that they were known for. Um, They were known for building a uh, water pipe system, one of the first places that had, uh, you might could say, plumbing uh, from this uh, water aqueduct that was about five miles away up in the mountains, and it was a mineral-filled hot springs and it was where people would go bathe themselves, and um, it was just uh, very hot water. And they found a way to use clay potting and, and build clay pipes, and they would actually have the water come down from the mountain to the city, and then they would use the water. Uh, the only uh, problem was by the time it got down there, it, it really had a nauseating smell to it, and it became very lukewarm. So it wasn't cold and it wasn't hot. It was lukewarm. They also were one of the first places that introduced uh, modern toilets. So um, they had uh, a place that you could sit down and and uh, use a toilet. And it was a modern-day um, a water system that would go underneath the toilets to flush all the, the waste away from the city. So uh, over a period of time, what happened to the church in Laodicea? Church history records that the church in Laodicea remained dramatic after most churches in Asia disappeared. One of its bishops was martyred for his faith in A.D. 161, about 70 years after John uh, wrote the warning to the church of Laodicea. Uh, which is recorded in the book of Revelation. In A.D. 363, Laodicea was the location that was chosen for significant church council. So it appears that the church of Laodicea learned its lesson, and God continued to bless the Christian community there uh, for some time. Also, we find that the Apostle Paul wrote in Colossians, 
and uh, we can actually see it up on the screen in Colossians chapter 4, verses 15 through 16, that he wanted uh, the book to be read among the later to So later to see was a very important uh, church at this time. Friends, it's great to have you with us this morning. I hope you enjoyed that little video clip that we played at the beginning. It shows you a lot of the uh, ancient uh, runes that are still left in that particular area in Turkey, better known as the um, city of Laodicea. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So if you have your Bibles, if you want to open those up to the book of Revelation, chapter 3, we're going to start with verse 14, and uh, I will be reading from the New King James uh, Version, and we're going to go ahead and get started, and I pray that this will bless you. Uh, one thing that you need to understand is that this particular church was a very important church to that area of the world at that time, uh, Rome. Uh, really um, used that city, that area, for a lot of different things to support their army uh, and many other things, uh, as you've seen in, in the video. But here, uh, the church of Laodicea, it was a real church that existed at this time, 2,000 years ago, and it also, I believe, Jesus picked these seven churches to represent seven periods of time throughout history that reflected on the church, his body, during those periods of years. I also believe that it has spiritual implications for every single believer. If we really we pray and we seek the Lord as we're reading and studying uh, the book of Revelation, we will see that there's different periods and times in our relationship to the Lord that we go through different struggles and temptations and trials and tribulations. And I think that these seven churches represent a lot of that in our own lives. So this particular church now, uh, what I want to really look at is what is the modern day, the 2023, the body of Christ really look at today? And I think if we go to different countries, we would see different things. But if we look at America and we apply this, these scriptures, and we look at it through the eyes of Christians living in America, I think it'll have a strong impact on us. So let us start reading in verse 14. This is what the Word of God says. And to the angel of the churches of the, uh, the church of the Laodiceans write. And again, remember here, the angel refers to the pastor, the leader of that particular church at that time, 1900 years ago, almost 2,000 years ago. These things says the Amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Okay, again here, this is Jesus speaking. And a couple of key things I want to point out here. He says the amen, uh, the faithful witness. Uh, the Lord is always faithful. So from, from Genesis 1 to Revelation chapter 22, the last verse, Throughout Scripture, when God speaks, He's always faithful and He's always true to His promises and to His Word. And we know that we can count on 
uh, the promises in God's word is always true. And then he goes on, he says, the true witness. So everything that Jesus said that he testified of, what he's testifying of here, and what he testified when he walked the earth 2,000 years ago, is the truth. And what he said is the truth. So that's something we can't, we, we, we can't just forget about. It's very important as you deal with, and as I deal with, modern day Gnostic cults, um, people that have drifted away and are atheistic or agnostic in their belief system. We have to know what we believe and why we believe it. And to know that when God speaks, he speaks the truth is absolutely important. So when the, when the people that are in the cults or the atheists try to attack God's word, you'll know that it's a lie and you'll be able to stand up and defend the Word of God and defend uh, God's truth to them and let it be spoken to them as it's a two-edged sword and let God do the work on them. You can't make them see the light. Only God can do that. But God calls us to be faithful witnesses. So we must know the truth about God's Word. It's very important, folks. And unfortunately, a lot of Christians don't know. Now, he goes on in, in verse 14, he says, the beginning of the creation of God. Now, this verse here is attacked uh, by the Gnostic cults. And in particular, the Jehovah Witnesses is one of them. Uh, Seventh-day Adventism would also use this verse and twist it into meaning that Jesus is not really God. He's a God, a small God, but he was created by God the Father. That is not what this actually says. So if you look at it at face value, and then you listen to the lies of these individuals, then you may have a tendency to get uh, confused about what, what the scripture is actually saying here. And this is why it's so important that every believer has a couple of tools at home that they can study from and go deeper into the Word of God. One of those would be a Strong's Concordance. This will give you all of the Hebrew from the Old Testament words and the Greek words from the New Testament where you can actually go and look up the word creation here. And actually what that means, it means the uh, originator and that, he, that Jesus was the beginning, he was the uh, originator of creation. And from many other scriptures, and remember, we always use two or three scriptures to back up what we, what we teach. You find throughout scripture that Jesus was in the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, where God is, is speaking and, and talking about creation, and that the Spirit of God, that's the third person, the triune Godhead, moved upon the face of the waters, was involved in creation. God spoke and said, let us make man in our image. Well, who was he speaking to? He was speaking to the triune nature of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There's other scriptures where Jesus is talking about that he created all things and that God the Father used him to create all things. Okay, so that is what this scripture is referring to, that in the beginning he was the originator of God's creation, of the creation of everything. So that's what this is talking about. But if you listen to the Jehovah Witnesses who come knocking on your door, well, I think since COVID they really don't do that, but if you ever get in a conversation with one, they try to use this scripture to prove their false doctrine that Jesus is really not God. He is uh, a little God. And that's a false doctrine. There's so many other passages that you can, that you can use to prove their errors. So, moving on, verse 15. Jesus says, I know your works. Now, he knows their works. He knows all the other six churches, their works. This is proof again of his deity. 
of his omniscience. His, he's all-knowing. He knows everything. And we've already read from the previous churches, he knows their thoughts. He knows everything. So there, there's nothing that an individual can hide from God. God knows everything. I know your works, that you are neither cold or hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. So in their relationship with the Lord, they weren't cold to where they were just had walked completely away from the Lord and they weren't they weren't um, progressing in their Christianity at all. They they were neither that or hot on fire for God, where everything was exciting and new and they were doing everything they could to serve the Lord. But they were lukewarm. And lukewarm was a it was a, is kind of the we can look at it where you're straddling the fence. You can't decide if you really want to serve God with everything you've got or you want to go back to Egypt. You want to go back into the world and serve the devil and live for the pleasures of this world like the prodigal son did. He didn't want to live at his father's house any longer. He wanted to take his inheritance and go out into the world and live among sinners. So that is what he's referring to here lukewarmness is is neither one but if you're going to be one jesus said he would prefer you to be hot of course or cold but not lukewarm and that tells us that god does not like it when christians are straddling the fence get on one side or get on the other but don't straddle the fence so hopefully that makes sense to you all right, verse 17, because you say, and he's speaking to them, I am rich, I have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. So right here, this shows, because of their attitude, that they are full of pride, and it's an ungodly pride, because they were very wealthy, um, they probably had a structure where they came together as Christians and worshipped, possibly, uh, and they just were, were, uh, were braggadocious about the, the, the lifestyle that they were li living, and they literally didn't feel like they needed anybody's help. Proof of that is history that uh, way back in their time period, they were struck by a major earthquake which destroyed the majority of the city and Rome because this city was had such a an important significance to, to Rome they were going to give them the money to rebuild and probably were going to send a legion of soldiers there to help help with it and these people were so full of pride they said we don't need your money we don't need your help we'll do it ourselves so th they were to this point where they trusted in their wealth and their riches which is something none of us should ever do. And Jesus goes on, he tells them what their problem is, and then he goes on and says this, And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. So because they were so full of pride, they didn't really understand their spiritual condition, which was miserable, wretched, poor, blind, and naked. So Jesus is telling them that you're in bad shape spiritually, and you better wake up. And Jesus goes on and says this, and I counsel you, and he's telling them, I counsel you, I'm giving you the best advice that you'll ever get. You need to buy from me, from, from Jesus, gold refined in the fire. So he's telling them that they need basically to come to him and to seek him and that he will give them all of the spiritual things that they need so that they can fulfill their destiny their god called destiny to live for christ keeping their eyes on jesus and taking their eyes off their wealth and prideful things and the things that they could accomplish with their own hands they needed to trust in the Lord, and, and the Lord wanted to give them everything that they needed spiritually 
to help them to, to, reach, to reach the world in, in their area and to be the godly individuals that they needed to be. So he's calling them out. He's rebuking them. And he's calling them out. And then he goes on and he says, you know, if you get this gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich in white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. So here again, it's a spiritual thing that the Lord is telling them, that if they really come to him, forget about themselves and come to him he is going to do something wonderful in their lives and that applies to you and me that sometimes we got to do a spiritual checkup on ourselves and put on the spiritual stethoscope and check our spiritual heartbeat to make sure that we're that we really love the Lord that he's number one in our life and that there's nothing else that we want Nothing in this world attracts us or pulls us away from our relationship with Him. That is so important. And as we get closer and closer to the coming of the Lord, Satan's ungodly, wicked activities are going to pick up, accelerate, and increase, and there's going to be more temptations, there's going to be more wickedness come before your eyes, to try to pull you away from the Lord. So you have got to equip yourself with the full armor of God, all of the things Jesus promises to give us, to live a godly life in this world right now. And if we'll do that, God will clothe us with his white garments, with his righteousness, not anything we could ever do. There's nothing we could ever do other than fall down at the cross and repent and give our heart and our life to the Lord and then he will give us everything we need to be able to live a godly life in this in this wicked world that we live in today hopefully that makes sense to you folks here I want to make one simple little uh, commentary note to this where Jesus talks about that he would anoint their eyes with eye salve see these particular people in this community they had developed a, a, an eye salve, and you probably watched that in the video, where it was a certain stone that was only found here, and they would grind it to powder, and they would mix some other stuff with it, and they made this paste that could actually uh, be used in the ears to help people if they had some kind of an ear infection, and also to be placed in their eyes, and it's believed that people had cataracts that this would actually help them to see better even with cataracts. They were known for this. They had a big medical school here. They were training people to be doctors. And it was with that eye salve that they became very uh, uh, bragging. They were bragging and they had pride because of something that they accomplished. Instead of giving the credit to the Lord, they took the credit. But they were actually spiritually blind, and that's where Jesus is talking about, that he will give them eye salve so they can truly see the spiritual condition. Because they had become spiritually blind to their own condition. And there's nothing worse than that, is that when an individual is spiritually blind to their own spiritual condition, and they don't realize that they're not living the life that God called them to live and they have backslidden and gone in the wrong direction and uh, th they don't know that um, it's it's a very very uh, dangerous dangerous situation to be in all right so moving on verse 19 says this as many as i love and here again this is the script i love when jesus says this when when the one that came and took the beatings, the chastisement of the flesh by the Roman soldiers and went to the cross for me and for you when he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chastise. 
and, and he will discipline those whom he loves. So folks, when we get to a place where we start to drift off and go in the wrong direction, and then the Lord rebukes us and chastises us, and, 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 and we feel that from the Lord, we should be rejoicing that the Lord, the creator of the universe, is taking time to stop us in our path in the wrong direction. And then he's turning us around and telling us to head in the, the right direction. Praise the Lord for that. Thank you, Jesus, for that. Hallelujah. I love that verse. As many as I love. Hallelujah. And then he goes on and says, Therefore, uh, be zealous and repent. So, when we get to the point where the Lord chastises us and rebukes us, we need to recognize that we have gone in the wrong direction, and then we just need to repent. And the Bible tells us that if we have a relationship with the Lord, all we have to do is to call out to Him and say, Lord, I'm sorry. Father, forgive me for what I've just done, what I just did. And in that microsecond, before the words can even get out of our mouth, the Lord is already in the process of forgiving us. Hallelujah. We serve a merciful, loving God, and it's not His will that any, any should perish. He wants every single human being that lives on the planet Earth to repent and to get saved. Uh, that's His will. Hallelujah. Verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Hallelujah. You know, there's only a few examples in Scripture where it says that Jesus, after his departure and going back to heaven, where he's seated at the right hand of God the Father, where it says he stands. Here, he says, I stand at the door and knock. So every single time that one of his children is in rebellion and is going astray, and when God is chastising you and rebuking you and you're under conviction and you need to repent, I believe from Scripture that the Lord is standing and waiting for you to repent. And when you repent, I believe that there is an outbreak in heaven of rejoicing that another one of the lost sheep that, that was, was one of the sheep that went, lo, that went in the wrong direction has come back to, to, to the fold. There's great rejoicing in heaven over that. Now, I can't 100% prove that from Scripture, so you just mark that down. That's one of my little uh, commentary notes. But I believe that. And, you know, if you look in Acts chapter 7, verse 55, when Stephen was being stoned to death, for his, for his stand and his relationship and his witness for Christ. It says this, But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And I believe that Jesus was standing there, seeing Stephen being stoned because he was such a faithful witness for Christ. And Jesus was the first one to welcome Stephen when he gave up the ghost. When, he, when his soul and spirit ascended to heaven, Jesus was the first one to wrap his arms around Stephen and, and say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Hallelujah. So it's a few scriptures here and there. I believe that when you go astray, and when you're about to repent, Jesus is standing, watching. He knows your heart. He knows your mind. He knows every intention. And if you are watching this now, and you know your relationship is not where it needs to be with the Lord, right now you can call out to the Lord. It's very simple. You can stop the video here, and you can just you can get on your knees. If you're unable to get on your knees, you can sit back in your chair. It's what's in your heart that matters to the Lord. And you can call out to the Lord and say, Lord, forgive me, cleanse me for, for, from, from walking away from you, for sinning against you. I ask you to forgive me and to cleanse me, to, to create in me a new heart, a new relationship, Lord. Lord, set me on fire for you, Lord, and let me, let me walk in your righteousness and your holiness. And if you mean that from your heart and your mind, the Lord will forgive you. Hallelujah. 
That's the beautiful thing about being a child of God, that occasionally if we, we, we sin and we walk astray, that as soon as the Lord rebukes us and chastises us and we have that conviction that we need to repent, we can do it in a microsecond and the Lord will forgive us. Hallelujah. That's something to shout about, folks. Praise the Lord. The world don't have that. People that are lost, they have nothing. They don't have the peace of God. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. We have been justified by everything that Christ did. I'm paraphrasing. And we now have peace with God. There's nothing better than having peace with God. Hallelujah. You know, me being a former Roman Catholic, being an idol worshiper, coming to know Christ. That is the verse that spoke to me more powerful than anything else was Romans chapter 5. After I became a born-again Bible-believing Christian, hallelujah, Romans chapter 5 verse 1 spoke to me so powerfully that I now had the peace all the years growing up in Catholicism and going and praying Hail Marys and praying with the rosary, confessing my sins to a priest, it didn't do anything for me. As a child, I never felt peace. As a child, I never felt like that was right. I knew something was wrong, but I, I couldn't put my finger on it. I didn't know better because I was surrounded by people that were Roman Catholic as well or Jewish people. Um, and I, I just didn't know the truth. But thanks be to the Lord that I found Jesus and accepted him as my Lord and Savior. And then the peace of God came in. I remember the day. I remember when the shackles and the chains and the big balls of iron of sin that were wrapped around my body and held me in bondage. That when, when I called out and repented, I believe Jesus was standing and he was looking and when God forgave me those shackles fell off the burdens and the peace of God came in and I was redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus hallelujah something to shout about and something to have victory about praise God hallelujah well I'm getting excited here folks let me get back to the scriptures. Verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone, hallelujah, anyone, it doesn't say a particular group of people, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, hallelujah, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Hallelujah. Folks, let me explain this to you. When where it says here, my, here's my voice and opens the door. When you are in a place, if you've never accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, and you start to really feel in your heart that you're missing something, something's not right, and you don't have peace in your life, that's the Lord knocking on your heart. He wants to come in. He wants to come in and to change your life, to give you his peace, his everlasting life. You think about that. We are going to live with God forever and ever. This mind can't begin to comprehend that. You know, how long is eternity? My mind can't, can't figure that out. I'm just too simple of a person to be able to figure that out. But it's the promises of God. And there's one thing I know for sure, that God's Word is true. It's sure. We can count on it. It hasn't been tampered with. It's inspired. It's God-breathed upon the writers of this Word. There's no other book on the face of the earth that can stand up against this book right here, folks. There's not a one. There's not enough atheists that can stand against this. There's not enough cultists or false religions, false prophets, false apostles that can deter me away from this book. I know it to be true. I've studied from someone, again, that, that's come out of Catholicism and never read the Bible. Once I got saved, God put this book in front of me and caused me to have a love for His Word 
that I never realized I would ever have. And I have studied that book on my knees for 40 years. And every single time that I open it up, every day that I open it up and I study, I see something new. And that is only God's Word can do that. And that's because the author of that book is still alive and present today. Every other book in history, all the authors are dead and buried. None of them were inspired. Only the Holy Bible has been inspired by the Creator of the universe. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. All right, verse 21. I love this. To him who overcomes, hallelujah, I will grant. And remember, whenever you read in Scripture where God the Father says, I will, or where Jesus says, I will, that is something that it relates to action. He is going to do something. He's not going to say something and then not do it. People do that all the time. But with God, he follows through on every single thing he says. Praise God. I will grant to sit with me, hallelujah, on my throne as I also overcame. What is he talking about? He's talking about that he came, he left heaven, came, took on human form through the Virgin Mary, became a young child, a baby, young child, grown man, and then went and preached the gospel, followed God the Father's will, was rejected by the nation of Israel and went to the cross to pay the ultimate sin sacrifice for all humanity once and for all for you and for me and he went to the cross he overcame all of that and hallelujah he overcame death so he went to the grave and three days later he comes walking out of the grave and has total victory over death so he overcame all of that stuff hallelujah and he goes on and says and sat down with my father on his throne hallelujah so here's some promises that if we are overcomers jesus is going to give us a place to sit near his throne hallelujah and I believe there's going to be a lot of people there sitting and we're going to be basking and looking at the at the Lord of glory in his full Shekinah glory hallelujah for all eternity we're going to serve him and live for him and have communion with him and fellowship with our Lord and we'll be able to praise him and worship him for all the good things that he's done hallelujah praise God verse 22 he who has an ear let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches so here again there's a there's a uh, counsel from Jesus if you have an ear hear what the Holy Spirit is speaking to the churches and what the Holy Spirit is speaking to you hallelujah now folks I want to give you this this concludes the seven churches but I want you to hold on now because I'm going to give you something I believe that's really going to bless you. I want to give you a recap of promises to believers from these two chapters uh, for all overcomers and conquerors of this present world. Hallelujah. This is good stuff, folks. All right. You may want to write these down. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life. So if you're a conqueror, when we get to heaven, we're going to be able to eat from the tree of life. To him that overcometh, will I give to eat the hidden manna. Now we have there's hidden manna that the Lord's going to give us. And we'll give him a white stone. So there's a white stone. And in the white stone a new name written so we're going to get a new name 
Hallelujah. To the one who conquers, I will give authority over the nations. So we're going to rule and reign with Christ. So we're going to have the tree of life, hidden manna, a white stone, a new name. We're going to uh, work with the Lord to rule and reign in righteousness over the nations. Hallelujah. He's going to give us the morning star. The morning star is Jesus himself. There's nothing better that you can get in heaven than to have the Lord. Hallelujah. No crown can compare. No jewels. No nothing. No mansion will compare to having the morning star, which is Jesus. Hallelujah. To the one who conquers, he will be clothed with white garments. Hallelujah. And I will never blot out his name of the book of life. Praise God. So our names will be written in the book of life, and they'll never be blotted out. And Jesus says, I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Hallelujah. He that overcometh, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Praise God. And he shall go out from thence no more. And I will write upon him the name of my God. Praise God. And the name of my, uh, the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and my own new name. So folks, we're going to get a new name. We're going to get uh, to be able to eat of the tree of life. We're going to get the hidden manna. We're going to have a white stone. We're going to uh, be able to rule and reign over all the nations of the earth with Jesus. Hallelujah. We're going to get the morning star, which I believe is a deeper relationship with the Lord than we have even here on this earth. Hallelujah. Because we're going to see him. We're going to be able to walk with him. We're going to be able to eat with him and have fellowship with him. We're going to be instructed by him what he wants us to do. So we will have the morning star. We're going to be clothed in white raiments, not of our righteousness, but of his righteousness. Hallelujah. And a pillar in the temple of, of uh, my God. And I will write upon him the name of my God, the new city, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Now, folks, that's a lot to take in. But these are promises from the Lord that if we are overcomers and conquerors, He is going to give us these things. And, folks, I don't think I even did any justice to, to the, these things telling you about them. I think that a lot of this is just going to be stuff that when we get there, uh, we're going to experience it and it's going to be a blessing to us. But, Overall, folks, I pray that this has blessed you, and most of all, that you continue to keep your eyes on Jesus, that you never backslide, you never go back. If you do, remember, you can repent and ask the Lord to forgive you and get back on track. But keep your eyes on Jesus, continue to run your race, and love the Lord with all your heart, mind, and soul. Until next time. God bless you and have a great day.